So, talking about delay, there's lots of things that cause delay. Um, you know, we've all done pings and you know, seeing how good our network was. But in the phone world, when we start getting over 100 milliseconds of delay, of, of delay uh, for a remote phone, you're going to start you're going to start noticing some some audio breakdowns pretty bad. Delay is caused by many things. The first thing is there is delay just based on the switches you go for every switch you bounce through. It's very short. But there's delay just from the switches you bounce through. There's also delay caused by encoders inside of the PBX during the data stream. We do what's called we often do things that are called transcoding, especially remote phones where you might have a G729 compressor um, on the PBX. Most phones that you buy today have a built-in G729 compressor inside of them. What this does is cut your bandwidth down less than half of what you're using on outside lines. More importantly, when you're using like a G729, though it increases your delay to that single channel, it reduces the overall packet size in half, which actually ups the probability of inserting that particular audio packet in the data stream three and a half to four times more probable when you have a stream going. Because there are more open, there are more open holes, small open holes, exponentially where, to where you have big open holes in your data stream. And so, if your if your data packet is half the size of the original data packet size, it's more likely you'll get inserted earlier in the stream, which causes less latency because you're you're getting in the stream faster when you have somebody else shoving big blocks. And so, the, this is the big case for all about using compressors. And a lot of people say, "Well, you use G seven twenty. There's a religion said." You use a G729 compressor, compressor, it doesn't sound as good. They're probably right. I mean, everybody knows that if you have an MPEG picture versus the, the original artwork, that the MPEG picture is not going to look as good if you've got a good enough eye. I work every day off a G729 phone. My phone switch is totally, my, my phone system is on one side of the country, our office on the other side of the country and all of our office phones are remote phones running on G729. So maybe I just don't notice it, but when I'm on office, the only time I notice is when I'm on one of the Polycom high-def phones. They sound really great, and so inside the local LAN, they, they sound great. Is there a separate licensing for 729 on Zorro Hedgehog? Yes, that's, that's a great question. Everybody pays for G729. Everybody in the world, they pay for G729. It's not included in our licensing fees or anything else. We don't we don't have extension licensing fees where you can throw as many phones on as you want. The G729 license is a license I believe you buy from the consortium is where I believe the money eventually gets to. And I think it's like seven or eight dollars a time it gets to the consortium. But like we buy ours from Digium. Don't have to, but we've, we you know if we're going to send out if we're gonna get get, get somebody G729, we would have them or we buy them on, 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 on Divium's website. I think they're like 10 bucks a piece, maybe 12. 10? $10. 10 a piece. But, but they are available from another company as well. I forget the name of them, but the restriction that you have in the G729 licenses for Digium is that they're applied to the serial number of the server. So let's say that you have a problem with that server and you want to move those licenses. It is not simple. And guaranteed beyond a shadow of a doubt, if you move it a third time, they will not renew it. That's a real problem. I mean, I, I had a problem with the situation. The customer was just livid. He had 50 G729 licenses, and we, they started the call center with about 20, 30 people. Overnight, they jumped up to 100 agents who had to switch their, switch their hardware, and then we blew a motherboard on one of the machines. Just one of the machines, not both the machines, but one of the machines. And we had to update. The, we had to get all new licenses because they wouldn't renew it the third time, and they're hard about it. So, if you find a better way to buy G729 license, let me know. But it is something. 
there's alternative companies. There's one alternative company, I forget the name. Uh, there are two options to that, buying from Digimon. One is this other company that doesn't apply to the, basically the perpetual licenses. You can float them wherever you want. You get like $12 each, a little bit more money, but you have the flexibility of floating them. Um, the other way is to buy a board, a PC board, that has the G729 licenses on the card. Uh, one of our biggest resellers, MTNSAT, they install all our systems on cruise ships. And they went to that because they can pull the G729 board out of one of our servers and put it into another server if they so desire. Because the licenses are on the board and then they they uh, make it work with the system. Or do any transcoding or It does it does the transcoding, yes. I, I, That's a high value exactly. When you have lots of G729s, the reason you would use it, the reason the board is designed in the first place, is it takes the transcoding off the server. Which uh, G729 is uh, let's see, it's at least five milliseconds plus some more. It's more than that. I think it's about seven milliseconds total. Um, but it takes it down to microseconds because the hardware is doing it. And so to the system, it, you never see anything, you know, with G711 coming out coming out of it. You know, it's sort of a frame no, but I can give you the contact easy. You can listen to the email. But they, they just plug in the circuit. Yeah, they don't just plug in. Um, it's, we use the uh, low profile cards, but there's a little nip on the standard cards. Just kind of get it. And it goes in. Yeah, we don't have the answer is yes. <laughs> okay. But it does, it does take reason well. With, 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 with a little bit of skill. Yeah, a little bit of skill with the machine shop. <laughs> we'll look into it after after I have another problem. And you have other things that come into this, like fixed patronization, variable output queuing, where it's, it's shuffling things around, fixed serialization delay, and it just it adds up. I mean, it just keeps adding up. And so, you know, at the end of the day, what you have to worry about is as you add more transcoding, as you add more uh, distance, as you add more routers like that, you're going to add more delay. You're going to start building up to 30, 40 milliseconds, even inside your local LAN, you know, sometimes. You just got to watch. Inside the LAN, for some reason, when you get in these high-def phones, or in about 30 or 40 second, milliseconds of, of latency, and you, you actually notice, the, you notice a degradation of performance. You know, a little bit of clipping, a little bit of squeaking, little things like that. In the outside world, you can get up to about 100 milliseconds. You really don't notice that much, except that it's a, a long... When you can you can talk on top of people. It's not breaking up. You're just starting to talk on top of people because of the latency difference between the two ends. So jitter is basically the variation of, of the packets as they're getting inserted. So like this one's getting inserted every 17 milliseconds, every 17 milliseconds, every 17 milliseconds. And then it goes to 100 milliseconds. Well, that's actually worse than just being inserted every 30 milliseconds so the jitter buffers can kind of adjust to yourself. We have things called automatic jitter buffers inside the system. What they do is they kind of watch your data stream. You're simply <clears throat> inserting packets pretty consistently, 17 milliseconds, 17 milliseconds, 17 milliseconds. So adjust the buffer so that it kind of will play between 5 and 30 milliseconds. You know, it'll, it'll store up the audio on the stream and it'll, 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 it'll take, take care of those variations. And then all of a sudden you have this big variation. This is what we're talking about the G7, G729, because you're, you're in certain packets just fine, and all of a sudden someone downloads you know, a picture of the president doing a dance on the screen and watching the, this video for about five minutes, and you all of a sudden bog down your network, and audio patterns aren't getting inserted. By shorting it, you, you increase the probability of getting inserted in the stream and decrease the jitter. The, the, the jitter, which is your variance between this 17 milliseconds and this 100 milliseconds, all of a sudden, you know, you've had 73 milliseconds of jitter. So, um, you know, other things that can cause jitter is packets that are dropped excessively. Now, that is true for, for a lot of things you're doing. It's not true on the audio stream for this UDP. You lose a packet, you lose a packet, and you're probably going to get a pop or a click um, in, in, you know, in the call. Um, 
Uh, another thing caused jitter is, is congestion. Not only congestion inside your network, but let me tell you, these, these ISPs are starting to oversubscribe their systems, and they're getting, they're getting a lot of congestion. So you had a packet that ran through one knock to your home, and then all of a sudden they're so congested it'll reroute to, another, to your house in another direction. Because it's physically going through different equipment and a different route, all of a sudden now those are two different latencies, and, and that, the difference between those two latencies is, is, is additional jitter. So... Um, the one that I always seem to like the best is that we, we seem to have one site that the forklifts can't seem to stay off our wire. And we hang up on the wall, and they seem to run the forks through. You know, smash cables, things like that. The nice thing about a routed network is you can kind of isolate your, your issues on where, you know, you can just do a very simple ping test, and if you've got a smash cable someplace, you're going to have some very bad ping requests. But don't be fooled that your ping request is what you're pinging to. You can have these two servers right here on a gigabit switch. And two buildings away on a fiber, fiber, you can have another switch where it has an Ethernet cable going to a computer that's talking to the server in the main, main computer room just doing MRP stuff. They don't care the cable's smashed, but they don't care about latency and jitter. It's, they just need some bandwidth. And they usually won't notice if they've lost a little bit just because some fork was thrown the pip. But the, the, if you do a ping, in those two boxes, it's going to show you that it's got some crazy latency times on the pings. And the only way you can find it is, is the old-fashioned tear the switch down in half method. You know, where you just go in and you, you tear down half, you, you pull the pull the start computer to your switches so that you pull off half your switches and see if your latency has gone away and so on and so forth. There's really no good way to find out where that, that switch is unless you have routed networks. Yeah, have routed network, you can find it because you're going to find which one of your switches is causing all your, all your grief because it's not going to broadcast those, those bad packets out. So, uh, packet loss is basically when, you know, you have a packet you send out that never gets, gets returned. And because telephony is all UDP paste, those are going to just get dropped and you're going to get, you're going to get things that sound like clipping or Donald Duck on the phones. <coughs> 